too, is I'll just start your bio and then uh, we're yep. up, up to close to 40 people now. So, yeah, so that's it. So first off, I'll, uh, I'll welcome everybody to uh, this month's uh, WAS uh, MIDI conference. So it's uh, the topic, it's all about honey. Uh, so Dr. May Berenbaum, she, she'll present on honey as a functional food for bees. And then later on, I'll present on my honey origins, uh, Yukon honey origins uh, study that I did. It's a citizen's uh, uh, science project. And uh, I'm a bee geek, so I got into lots of charts and numbers. Uh, but uh, first off, so quick uh, bio. So Dr. May Berenbaum has been a faculty of the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign since 1980, serving as head since 1992, and as Swanlund Chair of Entomology since 1996. She is known for elucidating chemical mechanisms underlying interactions between insects and their host plants, including detoxification of natural and synthetic chemicals, and for applying ecological principles in developing sustainable management practices for natural and agricultural communities. Her research supported primarily by NSF and the USDA has produced over 230 refereed scientific publications and 35 book chapters. A member of the National Academy of Sciences, she has chaired two national research committees or council committees the Committee on the Future of Pesticides in U.S. Agriculture, and the Committee on the Status of Pollinators in North America in 2007, devoted to teaching and fostering scientific literacy through formal and informal education. She has authored numerous magazine articles, uh, six books about insects for the general public. She graduated summa cum laude. Uh, yeah, with... Uh, B.S. degree in honors in biology from Yale in 1975 and received a Ph.D. in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University in 1980. So with that, I'll stop sharing. Uh, I will pass the floor to you and then I'll ask any of the panelists to, to mute their videos and their uh, and their uh, their mics just to save on bandwidth. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, that's a pretty old bio and a little bit embarrassing. It's more, more than you need to know. Um, let me share my screen and bring up my presentation and then preface, oh, I, I'm gonna turn my video off because uh, I have an unstable, I may have an unstable um, uh, internet connection on full screen. And I'll actually, I'd like to start um, with a caveat, uh, which I do whenever I talk to beekeeping group, I am an academic bee scientist, um, but I'm not a beekeeper. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, I know very little ab about practical information in relating to beekeeping. I, I know incredibly obscure um, historical bits of information um, like bees in heraldry or, or um, uh, bees on stamps, but, but don't ask me how deep the super should be. Um, I always learn something when I talk to beekeeping groups and I, and I will say the University of Illinois, we have a, a, a reconstructed prairie about five acres that we, um, a, a neglected land that we, reconfigured into a prairie savanna. The university has an ap university of Illinois has an apiary there. So uh, it's managed by the University of Illinois beekeeper. So I am a bee landlord, but I'm not a beekeeper. So with that, let me um, introduce you to a top topic that's very close to my heart. And one of the ways, actually I worked for years on caterpillars and really got interested in honeybees through honey rather than um, initially through an interest in, in bees, although now I love all things bee as well. Uh, so we, you, you need no introduction to this particular species. And uh, in fact, back in 1758, when uh, Carolus Linnaeus, uh, 
the first uh, to organize systematist who took it upon himself to give uh, names, scientific names to all uh, animals known at the time, named this bee uh, Apis mellifera, which literally means the bee that carries honey, their own meaning to carry. Uh, it's true that they can carry honey, but more often than not, they carry nectar. Uh, now they carry nectar uh, to make honey, and then within the hive, they'll transport the honey. But humans learned about this more than 9,000 years ago. And they learned especially to value honey and honeybees uh, to the extent that they would be willing, as did the ancient uh, rock uh, honey hunters depicted in um, the Cave of the Spiders Spanish rock paintings from about um, 7,000 BC, uh, where it was so valuable that they would brave the defensive reactions of the swarms of bees who are not happy about sharing their honey in order to collect it and to use it. Now, beyond a dozen references to honey in the Old Testament, there is actual archeological evidence of honeybee domestication in the form of a very large apiary that's been dated back to the 10th century BCE during the reign of the, 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 reign of the biblical King Solomon in an area called Tel Rehov in Israel. Uh, estimated there were probably more than a hundred of these clay hives uh, and that uh, the apiary could probably produce hundreds of pounds of honey um, back in biblical times. Now among the most appealing attributes of honey is that it's sweet and in nature intensely sweet substances are very rare. Throughout the middle ages honey was virtually the only sweetener available to Europeans up until about the 15th century when Spanish and Portuguese merchants introduced sugarcane into the New World tropics, into the colonies. And the only thing that made sugarcane a practical source of sweetness was basically the enslavement of uh, Africans and other non-white populations. Otherwise, it was too energy intensive to be practical. But uh, sadly, slavery made sucrose, table sugar, a cost-effective honey replacement. And it did basically uh, replace uh, uh, honey to a large extent um, throughout the 19th and more recently 20th century. And even in contemporary times, um, honey has lost a lot of its uh, uh, reputation as a sweetener. Uh, the nutrition community in the U US uh, in the mid 90s, for example, considered honey little different from sugar, basically being a concentrated solution of fructose and glucose being nutritionally little different from sugar with only physiologically insignificant traces of vitamins and minerals. Refined sugar may not have displaced more nut nutrient rich items, but only the nutritionally com comparable food honey. Now, when I read this, I was offended on behalf of the bees because obviously honey is way different from sugar. Um, and that should be obvious to anyone who's actually examined uh, plant chemistry. Uh, honeys from different plant sources vary in color, in odor, in taste, in physical properties, and they are so much more than just concentrated solutions of sugars. So that's actually when I got interested in honey, uh, sort of on behalf of the bees to uh, um, give them a um, give them their due in creating such a remarkable substance. So honey, for example, has had a long history, almost, almost 5,000 years of use as a medicine. There is hieroglyphic art dating back to 2500 BCE in the fifth dynasty of preparations, medicinal preparations that were made with honey and some uh, representations of bees in beekeeping. Uh, through the Middle Ages, uh, this, um, this is a, basically the Arab um, reprint, if you will, of Dioscorides, uh, the uh, Greek uh, early physician philosopher uh, who recorded actually physiologically active um, uh, natural substances uh, that were useful in medicine. And uh, um, so these, uh, the use of, of preparation of medicine from honey continued through, through the centuries. Here it is in the 18th century, The Virtues of Honey by John Hill, showing that uh, honey prevents uh, many of the worst disorders in certain, and in a certain cure of several others, particularly gravel, asthma, coughs, hoarseness, and a rough morning phlegm. 
Now, the concept that foods contain components with therapeutic value other than strict nutritional value led to the com uh, concept of uh, what were called nutraceuticals in the 1990s. And this concept of, of nutraceuticals, compounds in foods that have um, physiological benefits other than strict nutrition, uh, and the concept of functional foods, foods and food components that provide essential nutrients beyond quantities necessary for normal maintenance, growth and development or biologically active components that impart health benefits or desirable physiological effects uh, became popular. Uh, and uh, this recognition of functional foods uh, and uh, foods that contain physiological active, physiologically active compounds that um, promote human health really has helped to restore honey's reputation as healthful. And in fact, the concept of honey as a healthful food has been steadily increasing in popularity. This is a, a, um, a search on Google Trends. This is an app on Google that allows you to uh, look uh, at the collective searching habits of everyone on Google over a defined time period. So you can see from January 2004 all the way to uh, May 2022, there has been a steady, steady upward trend in interest in um, healthy honey or the health value of honey. And in fact, it's in pop culture as well. If you read tabloid newspapers, you would believe honey could cure just about anything. Um, AIDS with anemia, wound healing, heart regulation, jaundice, mouth disease, hangovers, treatment of ulcers and weight reduction. It's hard to imagine what relevance some of these putative properties might've had for bees. I don't think bees get ulcers and I'm almost positive, although they will consume ethanol, that they don't have hangovers. So what exactly is honey and is it a healthful food for, for bees who are producing it? Well, take a look at what goes into honey. Again, it's mostly nectar. There's honey honeydew that gets in there and some other substances, but by and large, it's nectar, which is a sugar-rich floral secretion that's produced by plants for the sole purpose of serving as a reward for an animal partner to facilitate pollination no other function in the life of the plant. Um, it's about 80% water, typically it can vary. Uh, main primary constituents are glucose, fructose, and sucrose, and there are traces of B-complex vitamins. But because honey is generally made from nectar, it contains everything that's in nectar. Uh, and just like other parts of the plant, nectar is full of what are called phytochemicals. These are sort of the non-nutritive, uh, so-called secondary metabolites that, that uh, uh, plants make primarily to protect themselves against their enemies, including bacteria and fungi. The distribution of these phytochemicals is idiosyncratic across plant families. So the main characteristic of, of these defensive phytochemicals is that they um, uh, vary from uh, family to family of plants and often species to species. So here's some, some familiar ones. Here's honey and grapes with has uh, many of these phytochemicals are known for their therapeutic or their nutraceutical value for humans. But the uh, um, Aliaceae, garlic and onions have these sulfide compounds. Uh, cabbages and broccoli have sulf uh, sulfur containing sulforaphane and then uh, nitrogen containing indole 3 carbonyl. So most families of plants have characteristic um, secondary chemistry. So bees go to great lengths to make honey. Uh, most flowers don't contain very much nectar and an individual bee can't carry much at a time. About 85% of her body weight, which is about a 10th of a, uh, of a gram. And she'll make 30 trips in a day visiting 50 to 100 flowers per trip. And over the course of her month long life, a forager can visit 90 to 100,000 flowers. And it takes a million flowers to make just one pound of honey and a productive colony can make 200 pounds a season. A lot of work there. Um, because nectar is mostly water with a, a low concentration of sugars, the first step in converting it to honey is to reduce the water content from about 80 to 90% down to about 13 to 18%. So foragers bring honey uh, nectar back to the uh, hive and offload uh, the, the nectar to hive bees who concentrate uh, the nectar by regurgitating droplets onto their tongues, increasing the surface area up to 200 times. Um, so they suck it up, spit it out, suck it up, spit it out. While some bees are regurgitating, others are fanning their wings uh, 200 times per second um, to circulate uh, air and 
accelerate the evaporation process. Honeybees are, by the way, better at reducing the water content of nectar than any other bee species. Here you see Apis getting water down to 21%. Um, Serana can reach, and Floria can reach 20, but uh, uh, Mellifera is, is really good at, at uh, concentrating down the honey and much better than the non-Apis species as well. Not every uh, bee, of course, makes honey. Uh, it is a really unique substance. Okay, evaporation is only one of the chemical changes involved in converting nectar into honey. Even before it's regurgitated, bees can use the enzyme invertase, sometimes called sucrase or saccharase. Uh, I don't think it's ever called um, sugar clipper, but it converts sucrose, which is a disaccharide made of two monomers or monosaccharides, into its component um, sugars. So. The, the disaccharide becomes two monosaccharides. This, this conversion serves several purposes. Breaking down sucrose into its component monosaccharides, predigests it, makes it easier for grubs and workers to process because fructose is more soluble in water than sucrose. Increasing fructose at the expense of sucrose reduces the length of crystallization. Converting su sucrose into fructose and glucose also increases the number of molecules in this aqueous solution because every sucrose molecule becomes two molecules of monosaccharide. So as um, the invertase uh, goes about its activity, there are more and more solutes put into solution. This increases the osmotic potential, which uh, basically can uh, rupture cell, cell walls of microbes. Um, so the supersaturated solution of sugars is inimical to the growth of microbes. Just here, just a schematic here, water goes from 50 to 90% down to less than 20. Flavor factors are added. The, uh, the honey uh, matures, as you'll see, um, in cells that are lined with propolis. Um, and uh, we'll see this uh, reaction in a minute here. The salivary enzyme, there's another enzyme involved called glucose oxidase, and it converts oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and that's antimicrobial, you'll hear you see it. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, it um, kills bacteria and other microbes. And in the process, um, it also um, converts glucose, this monosaccharide, into gluconic acid. This is acidic, so that conversion, the production of gluconic acid, lowers pH. And that also discourages microbial growth. So just about all of the biochemical processing makes honey a very difficult place for microbes to establish, which makes it storable. Now, after the biochemical processing, incipient honey is packaged by placing it into wax cells lined with propolis, uh, where it continues to lose water until it reaches its final concentration. Before it's capped with wax, it sits in the hive for a few days at hive temperatures of about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry for no metric uh, equivalence here. Many of the potential toxic nectar constituents are actually broken down. So in a sense, bees are among the very, very few animals, including humans, that cook their food. Bees cook honey by allowing it to sit in the, um, the heated hive. And that does serve the purpose of, of breaking down some of the, or at least reducing the concentrations of some of the toxic phytochemicals that might be in, in been brought in with the nectar. This is just uh, data from a study by Liu et al. in 2005, where they have uh, aloe um, nectar that's been freshly deposited, and they compare that to the nectar uh, that's been um, incubating at high temperatures. And the phenolic content, nectars are rich in phenolics, but after a um, few days at high temperatures, the phenolic content actually decreases. Okay, so honey is a processed food. Look at all the steps from flower to stomach, invertase added, receivers take control, dropped into cells, fanning to evaporate, glucose oxidase and sealed in wax, a sweet job, uh, an inevitable pun um, in uh, any article ever written about bees or honey. Uh, so why then do bees go to all that trouble? And it is in part because honey has tremendous health benefits for bees. Uh, First, um, because of its nutritional content, it's what makes the energy intensive honeybee lifestyle possible. Honeybees, as you know, live in year round colonies of 30 to 50,000 workers consuming bee bread made from pollen certain times of year and honey made from nectar. 
So they use this sugar-rich nectar as a basis for honey, a carbohydrate food source for their grubs, and an energy source for adult workers, a metabolic fuel for heating. Honeybees among the very few insects that maintain a colony around a few social insects. In winter, they huddle in a cluster and eat honey for energy to shiver and generate metabolic heat, as I expect you guys up north know, are very familiar with, and sorry if this is re uh, repetitive, but this way honeybees can maintain their hive temperatures even when it's very cold outside. It's also used for fuel for manufacturing. Wax for comb is produced by abdominal glands and of young workers. Honey provides the metabolic fuel for um, producing the glandular secretions and in about eight to 10 pounds of honey are consumed to yield one pound of wax. Okay, so there's a lot in honey that goes into honey. Of the constituents of honey, sugars are the fuel for energy. They also um, determine the likelihood of any particular honey to crystallize. Uh, they influence the water content and through that glucose to gluconic acid transformation, they affect pH. Of honey constituents, it's the phytochemicals, however, that affect many aspects of honey's biochemistry. Uh, they're just some ex representative phytochemicals that range from aliphatic compounds, alkaloids, benzene derivatives, carotenoids, flavonoids, monoterpenes, organic acids, and phenolics. They affect the color, flavor, and aroma. Um, some phytochemicals affect viscosity and thixotropic properties. That's the tendency of honeys to go from a gel upon standing to a liquid when stirred. Heather honey, for example, and manuka are um, thixotropic. Uh, and their antioxidant capacity, their ability to halt enzymatic browning, as well as their osmotic potential. So again, beekeepers are familiar with the fact that uh, honeys are different colors, and they're different colors along the fun chart from water white to dark amber uh, because of their phytochemicals, many flavonoids, uh, and carotenoids in particular, as well as some phren uh, phenolics, are colorful. And they're among the phytochemicals in honey that contribute to its color and taste. As well, flavonoids, phenolics, and carotenoids are among the phytochemicals that are antioxidants. And antioxidants are molecules that can share electrons with other mo molecules and stop what's called a free radical chain reaction. Okay, so what happens is, um, most compounds, most uh, chemical compounds like to have paired electrons. And if, in fact, if they're unpaired, um, most compounds will, uh, if they come in contact with another content, uh, compound, will just take an electron uh, and in order to basically fill that orbital to make sure they're paired. And then that compound steals an electron from any other molecule it encounters, and so on and so on. That's a free radical chain reaction because molecules with unpaired electrons are highly reactive and among other things can react with oxygen um, and in its stable state, take an, uh, an electron and end up generating what are called these um, uh, free radicals, including uh, superoxide anion, unpaired here, uh, peroxoid, peroxides, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxy radical, and a hydroxyl ion. Um, and an antioxidant is uh, a, a molecule because of its uh, um, sort of, uh, structure, its, its atomic structure, tolerates having an unpaired electron, does not initiate these free radical reactions. And so many of the phenolic acids, flavonoids, and, um, carot uh, and carotenoids you find in honey are antioxidants. Now, neutralizing free radicals in humans um, is thought to have a wide range of health benefits for, for, for people, including longevity enhancement. This is a, just a sample of some of the recent literature and you can see important for health and longevity uh, for humans on aging and longevity, long antioxidants and longevity medicine, antioxidants and aging, functional foods to promote healthy aging and longevity in humans, um, re reactive oxygen species, generation antioxidant defense systems, uh, exceptional human longevity and antioxidants and so on and so on. Um, lots of products you can buy without very much uh, scientific evidence behind them, but at least with the promise of a long, healthy life. Um, but are they present sufficient amounts in honey to be a functional food for humans? Um, well, we were uh, 
this is the moment where I got interested in bees through honey, wanting to um, basically restore their reputation as a healthful product. And to do so, we looked at monofloorals. So polyfloral honeys come from nectars of many different species. Monofloorals are kind of defined operationally as coming from the nectar of principally one flower species, where the pollen indicates that more than 50% derive from one uh, floral source. So because flowers differ in the production of of uh, antioxidants in their nectar, uh, monofloral honey should as well. And in uh, 1998, we carried out an experiment comparing um, 14 different monofloorals um, to measure their antioxidant activity. And what we found along with variation in color from um, almost water white down to uh, um, this dark amber, uh, Illinois buckwheat, we found uh, basically 20-fold variation in antioxidant content. And at the higher levels, California sun, sunflower and uh, um, Illinois buckwheat, uh, they're about the equivalent of some of the vegetables that are famous for um, their antioxidant content, including spinach and garlic, and they taste so much better. And today, honey's being marketed uh, for its antioxidant power. Uh, you can go on online at Am and uh, on Amazon and order um, uh, honey that has uh, is known for its antioxidant uh, properties. One of my colleagues here in food science actually did a study with black tea flavored with sugar versus um, uh, honeys. Uh, yeah, and then uh, in a study with uh, uh, two dozen male volunteers and showed that the rate at which um, serum uh, lipids peroxidized was actually lower with the, in the group that, that consumed their tea with honey. So it's considered a functional food for humans, but this left me with the question is, is that a functional food for the organisms that make it for honeybees? Do they need it for more than sugar? And, and in fact, uh, this has been a subject of attention in our lab for, for many years now. Um, my uh, uh, initially a uh, student who became a postdoc who's now a research scientist uh, at the University of Illinois, Ling Shu Liao, uh, has done some uh, of the first work to demonstrate, in fact, that dietary phytochemicals found in honey um, have um, life enhancing, longevity enhancing properties, and as well um, can defend honeybees against uh, uh, reduced toxic vector pesticides. So here you see these two compounds, picumeric acid, which is almost universal um, because it is the monomer that builds up sporopollenin, which is the polymer that is on the cell wall of pollen grains, uh, and uh, quercetin, which is uh, widespread, also found in pollen grains across many, many different plant families. Uh, so if, uh, you give honeybees um, the uh, just sugar water. That's their survive. The in black is their survival, uh, their longevity, the survival function. And you can see uh, the blue color picumeric acid, the orange color quercetin, and both of them together uh, manage to prolong the life of adult workers significantly, um, and uh, demonstrating that in fact the antioxidants uh, do appear to have a longevity enhancing effect on the workers. Now beyond its antioxidant activity, honey is known to possess antimicrobial activities. Hydrogen peroxide is a sterilizing agent, gluconic acid lowers the pH, but some honeys have antimicrobial activity that is independent of the universal property of peroxide production and gluconic acid production. And what's behind the, um, the uh, antimicrobial activity of many honeys then, the so-called non-peroxide honeys, um, are the phytochemicals. And probably the most famous of the non-peroxide honeys is from uh, is Manuka honey, which comes from Leptospermum scoparium in New Zealand. Um, and it contains uh, a compound called uh, methylglyoxal, which derives from um, diahydroxyacetone, which is present in the flowers of, of the Manuka shrub. Uh, and it is so effective as an antibacterial that is approved uh, as uh, for wound treatments by the federal uh, uh, FDA 
Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. and uh, for uh, wound dressings. So you can go again to drugstore and buy manuka honey um, adhesive pan band, uh, wound dressings. Uh, and it has become, uh, and all kinds of cosmetics, it's become immensely popular. So popular, in fact, that in 2014, the New Zealand Ministry of Primary Industries reported they were producing only 1,700 tons of manuka honey, yet over 10,000 tons of manuka honey was being sold in the global market. So uh, there's rampant, um, uh, I guess, uh, not honey laundering, but uh, um, honey, uh, um, imposter honey is being sold. And uh, manuka that you uh, buy in the store may actually be adulterated or diluted with other honeys. Um, and you can see the advertising here when the news came out that manuka is a wellness wonder, but your jar could be a fake counterfeit manuka. Um, and uh, the US legal system being what it is, the North Circuit, the Ninth Circuit rather, um, which includes California, basically decided that uh, um, Trader Joe's was labeling its uh, honey as 100% New Zealand manuka. And the pollen testing showed that only about 60% of the honey was manuka. But the court decided um, that it's important to consider the context, uh, including a reasonable consumer's likely background and knowledge. Evaluating this advertising would be mis would mislead a reasonable consumer uh, and actually um, found uh, in favor of, of Trader Joe's saying it's okay to sell counterfeit Manuka and call it Manuka. So that's American, that's the American legal system for you. Okay, uh, so phytochemicals and nectar can prevent microbial growth and in honey, um, phytochemicals are actually um, toxic to many honeybee pathogens in this uh, paper by uh, Erler and Moritz from 2016, you can see um, the predators and path, uh, parasites uh, against which um, honey was tested. And in fact, it's effective against the very relevant uh, Pinum bacillus um, larvae, which is American fowl brood, sorry. Um, also Aspergillus flavus, which is stone brood, a fungal disease and uh, also kills nosema, another fungal or microsporidian disease of bees. So um, the honey does have an antimicrobial activity uh, that is, would be protective against bee pathogens. And in fact, the bees seem to know that. Uh, in a really remarkable study uh, by Germain et al. from 2014, um, nurse bees were infected with nosema and then given a choice between honey types. Uh, and uh, invariably infected workers preferred honeys with higher anti-nosema activity um, than uh, other honeys. So somehow honeybees seek out their, uh, their own medicine. They self-medicate and they can differentiate among honey types to eat uh, the honey that's best for what ails them. Um, and uh, these authors call this a potentially a highly adaptive form of therapeutic medication at the individual and the honey colony level. It is absolutely astonishing. It's one of the reasons I'm just so impressed by bees. I go to the, you know, when I don't feel well, I don't even know what to buy at the drugstore despite being able to read labels. How they do this is nothing short of amazing, but they do. Honey also promotes detoxification of environmental poisons. Uh, now bees, like most other air breathing animals, um, rely on a uh, a, a number of enzyme superfamilies to detoxify um, both natural and synthetic toxins. Uh, and chief among them are uh, the, what are called the cytochrome P450 monooxygenases, P450s for short. And basically these enzymes um, catalyze a reaction that takes a lip lipophilic or lap fat soluble molecule, attaches an oxygen functionality to it to produce uh, hydroxylated um, water soluble molecule that is more less toxic, that is, it's less likely to interact with lipid rich targets in the body. And because it's more water soluble, it's more excretable. This is called phase one metabolism, uh, characteristic of, of, again, most uh, air breathing uh, organisms. Uh, and uh, it's a huge um, 
gene super family, about 11,000 are, are known. Um, they're very diversified except for a heme binding seeps, one little signature motif, which is associated with an iron um, atom that allows this uh, um, oxygen functionality to be uh, attached. And honeybees, in fact, P450s are responsible for changing the structures of phytochemicals and pesticides so they are no longer toxic to bees. Uh, so my former student, Reed Johnson, now doing spectacularly well on the faculty at Ohio State, showed um, in his uh, thesis work here that uh, honey can upregulate or turn on cytochrome P450s that can metabolize uh, food constituents, including um, uh, aflatoxins from aspergillus, uh, stone root, and quercetin from, uh, from honey. And uh, a diet of honey enhances survival of bees in the face of, uh, in the presence of aflatoxin B1, which is a mycotoxin produced by the fungus that causes stone root relative to high fructose corn syrup or, or just plain sucrose. When they, 41% uh, 40, of bees in, in a, a trial survive while consuming aflatoxin with sugar, that number ri rises to 55% that survive if they're eating aflatoxin with honey. It was the first evidence we had that people for 50s were uh, really important for metabolizing toxins. Uh, we went on to identify the specific P450s that metabolize uh, both synthetic and natural uh, substrates. And there are multiple uh, phytochemicals that are metabolized. Two major, okay, honeybees have 46 uh, genes that encode P450s. Of these, about 28 are in, involved in metabolizing foreign substances or xenobiotics. And of, of these, of the 28, there's really only about four that can metabolize uh, pesticides such as neonicotinoids. And they're in the so-called CYP9Q family. I apologize for the terminology. It is not at all euphonious, but uh, biochemists seem to like it. Combinations of numbers and letters. Uh, this, uh, and we know this limited capacity because uh, um, Manjon et al. Uh, in 2018 actually um, cloned all of the, all 46 of the P450s in the honeybee, expressed them in a cell system to determine the activity of the enzymes against various substrates, also expressed them in fruit flies by tra transgenically uh, to test their ability to tolerate pesticides. Uh, and uh, sure enough, these are the enzymes, just a, just a fraction of the, the um, total complement, which is very small. It's only about one half to one third the size of um, the SIPOM, the collection of cytochrome P450 genes in other insect genomes. They have about the second fewest number of P450s. That's a whole different lecture, really uh, amazing how they cope with so few, but that's bees for you. Um, and uh, so other 9Q members that we found can actually detoxify the caricides that beekeepers, I'd say, used to put in to their uh, hives. They're now uh, no longer used widely because mites are resistant to talfluvalinate, which is py uh, py pyrethroid, and cumaphos, which is an organic organophosphate. So uh, CYP9Q1, 2, and 3 can metabolize these acaricides as well as quercetin. This is work done by Wen Fu Mao in, in my lab, who went on to work for Vesteron in Michigan. Um, and he found that there are specific compounds in honey um, or pollen that turn on or upregulate these enzymes um, that can break down natural and synthetic toxins. And here are the best of the inducers, Picomeric acid, which is found in pollen and also in propolis, pin pinobanxin, 5 methyl ether, pinobanxin, and pinosemrin. These are mostly found in propolis, which gets into the honey because the honey sits and incubates in uh, cells that are lined with propolis. Moreover, we did an analysis called RNA seq. That lets you uh, basically introduce um, a, a disturbance of some sort, in this case, a phytochemical, into the um, the honeybee to see which genes are turned on uh, when the bee encounters these chemicals. And when they consume um, P. cumeric acid, uh, the, the one um, that, uh, this is one that's very widespread in honeys and in um, propolis, at least in North America, look at all the P450s that are turned on. And in fact, the ones in the CYP6AS subfamily 
metabolize quercetin, a phytochemical. Uh, so those are the phase one enzymes. There's other stages of detoxification that include conjugating um, the metabolite of, of phase one with a basically a chaperone molecule to get it um, to move within the cell. And then phase three uh, enzyme or uh, proteins that pump um, this, this bulky molecule metabolite out of the cell. They're all turned on when bees eat picomeric acid as they would when they consume honey and uh, including some immune, uh, immunity genes like a, a basin. That's a, actually a, an antimicrobial peptide made by bees. Um, and uh, even more detoxification immunity genes are upregulated by picomeric acid in the larvae. These are all the, um, the immunity genes that are turned on. Okay, picomeric acid also increases bee, honeybee longevity uh, when bees are exposed to imidacloprid, quercetin alone and in combination with picomeric acid enhances longevity um, in the face of pesticides. So these honey turns on the detoxification system of honeybees. And picomeric acid, just one of the dozens of phenolic acid and flavonoid constituents in honeybees that upregulate these um, cytochrome P450s. Uh, and again, many of these compounds that are very active in turning on the immunity uh, genes and the detoxification genes um, come from propolis, apparently. So other phytochemicals in honey affect behavior and enhance memory of bees. Um, caffeine, for example, enhances memory, uh, just like it does for college students. It improves cognitive performance and motivation in learning complex tasks like uh, it did for me this morning. So honey is a functional food for bees. Uh, beekeeper bringing cost-saving practices, substituting sucrose or high fructose corn syrup then may have effects on the toxicological and, immun and immunological defenses of honeybees because it lacks phytochemicals. And a colony, of necessity, honeybees use many species of plants over the course of a year to collect nectar and pollen for honey and bee bread. So honeybees may actually require phytochemical diversity in their diets. What's more, bees that consume honeys with a diversity of phytochemicals are more tolerant of pesticides. This is work we haven't yet published, but it was eye-opening. We, again, looked at uh, um, uh, mon monoflorals, tupelo, locust, and buckwheat, compared to sugar. Uh, and uh, also to a choice of all three together, exposed the bees to bifenthrin and discovered that the LD50, the, the dose that kills half the test population uh, is actually much higher and is related to the, uh, here, to, it's correlated with the presence of, of different phytochemicals in the different honeys. So that diversity of phytochemistry is important in um, allowing bees to tolerate pesticides. And buckwheat is kind of the champ. It's got the largest number and the highest concentrations of phytochemicals, and it uh, raises the LD50 uh, significantly more than um, consuming sugar, for example. All right, well, monoculture, agriculture doesn't provide a diverse diet for honeybees. This is Champaign County where I live. And you, if you know anything about Illinois, you can guess that the yellow is corn. This is a sort of plant vegetation cover. Green is soybeans and the little non-yellow, non-green colors are other vegetation here. Not, met, not much. Pollen and nectar are getting harder to find. The U.S. has more acreage of lawn and turf grass than corn, soybeans, orchards, vineyards, and nut trees put together. And unfortunately, per acre, lawns receive more pesticide applications than agricultural land. Moreover, for 20 years, persistent droughts in the western U.S., um, where some of you are from, associated with climate change, means migratory beekeepers have trouble finding enough food for their bees. So here's the drought area. There's drought index of the western U.S., uh, and this is where often bees are taken to overwinter and to, um, for managed pollinator services. Coast-to-coast uh, -coast clean weed-free fields without fences, have no nectar and nesting resources. So bees rely on phytochemicals, um, not only for their health, but also as feeding cues to differentiate soda, which is non-nutritive in many cases, um, based on car carbon isotope ratios, with, uh, which differ uh, uh, in corn syrup and floral nectar. So they can, uh, you can see here, um, wild bees that are not managed, feral bees, um, tend to have much lower um, uh, ratios of the isotope of carbon associated with 
with sugars, with um, uh, sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, than do managed bees, which are often fed to, uh, by beekeepers to bees. So they, they, they need phytochemicals to recognize good food. But if only if flowers are available, nectar and pollen shortages may have consequences beyond just starvation if bees resort to unnatural food sources, which they often do and um, end up in the newspaper when they do. They, uh, um, they compete with honey, hummingbirds for uh, nectar for sugar solutions in, nect uh, in uh, hummingbird food. Um, <laughs> they, they love caffeinated sodas um, with high fructose corn syrup. And occasionally they will forage as these bees did to make red honey, bright red honey. These were bees that lived just down the street from a Maraschino cherry factory and they were taking a shortcut to getting um, sweet foods to make their, their honey. Ditto for Utah beekeepers who were dumping, uh, well, keeping bees near where candy cane, waste candy canes were being dumped and the honey was very minty and red flavored. Um, a pile of waste, uh, blue and green um, M&Ms in France actually had bees producing uh, blue and green honey. So if there's good food available, healthy flowers, they'll feed on them, but not if there are no, uh, no other sources of, of food and bees depend on phytochemicals and variation in, uh, in those phytochemicals and a very and, and, and diverse diet. Uh, so there's a perception that honey can improve human health. Look at all these in uh, all kinds of ways. There it is next to uh, the comb for humans. And most people though, don't really know how amazing honey is. It is made for bees and it is amazing for bees. It is um, important for activating their immunity genes or detoxification genes. It can improve, that's another story, improve cold tolerance, greater longevity and faster wound healing in addition to nourishment. So honey needs flowers for phytochemicals. Will there be flowers for bees to visit in the future? Well, Luther Burbank, the famous bot botanist of, uh, um, said flowers always make people better, happier and more helpful. May, they are sunshine food and medicine for the soul. They are also sunshine food and medicine for bees. And with that, thank you for listening. Thanks to all the people uh, I've worked with over the years, um, postdocs, research scientists, former students, current students, Jean Robinson, who runs our uh, University of Illinois Bee Research Facility, without whom, uh, without whose indulgence, none of this work would have been possible. I can say the same for USDA um, uh, NIFA, which has funded our work. And with that, let me just say thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, this was in December, by the way. This is a discarded uh, gingerbread house. And it was a warm day and the honeybees found it irresistible. Nice. Thank you very much. Very informative. Well, I, I know some parts probably are just so familiar to beekeepers, but uh, I have to get through those to get to the parts that may not be so familiar. So thank you for your indulgence. Appreciate it. And we've got a mixed group of uh, advanced to intermediate to beginner beekeepers. So it's a mix of everything. So for beginners, it's things they probably don't know and once you know something you don't know then it's an opportunity to <laughs> learn more about it and uh, that's the point of these workshops is to introduce concepts that people may not be aware of um, um, and i see dewey karen uh, who a name that's very familiar to me so um it's a famous guy <laughs> Yeah, so what we'll do is uh, if folks have questions, we can use the Q&A. Uh, and uh, yeah, and if any of the panelists have any questions, uh, we'll go there. So I'll just start with a quick one. Uh, so for because we're mostly beekeepers, from a practical perspective, how does one know if their honey is high in, say, that uh, cumeric acid, the P cumeric acid, or different things like that, because that 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 rang out to me. So, how do we know if our, our honeys are actually one of those wonderful honeys to have? Well, you know, um, probably the specific ingredients aren't as important as the collective antioxidant activity, um, because many different uh, phytochemicals uh, can contribute to the total. Um, 
activity of the honey. Um, and, and that's the same for antimicrobial activity. And the way we do it, there's a chemical assay that is pretty straightforward that will measure that activity using sort of a model substrate. But it's not, it's not a kid, it's not readily available. Uh, and it's, it's the same problem. Um, you can't really tell antioxidant content when you're buying um, spinach or garlic or tomatoes or, uh, you know, so I wish there were an easier way. Um, there's a lot of people that are, uh, a lot of beekeepers are sending their, their um, honey or even um, other hive materials to analytical laboratories to find out if there's pesticide contamination. Those same uh, um, services can identify the phytochemicals in honey, but I'm not sure it would be uh, that inf uh, informative um, because it's likely to change over the season too. That's the amazing thing about bees is they keep this operation going you know, from, from uh, May through uh, uh, October, at least here. And what truly amazes me is how, how they know. Um, I, I need an expensive HPLC mass spec to figure out what compounds are, are in, for example, propolis, but bees, honeybees unerringly can find resins. I mean, there are all kinds of plants produce resins, but they select only a subset that have these active materials. Nobody knows how. They are just unbelievable. You know, I spent 20 years studying insects other than bees. And when I switched to bees, I had to forget everything I learned about other insects because bees are different. Bees do things differently. It's because they're eusocial. They have, uh, well, for example, detoxification. One reason they may have, this is a hypothesis, so few um, genes encoding these P450s for detoxification is that they have behaviors. They use their behavior to detoxify. First, very sophisticated um, selective feeding and then heating up the honey in the hive, uh, treating it in other ways that might cut down on the, on the toxins. Just amazing, absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, should we call on, uh, I see Dewey has a hand up. Yeah, absolutely, Dewey. Hi, May, how are you doing? Hi, nice to hear and nice to sort of see you. Yeah, uh, okay, I'll turn it on him. Uh, May, I had a question and, and you had talked about how um, validating honey as a food for bees led you to your studies and also then how that affects, can affect humans in our own diet. What, what about other organisms? We collect pollen to feed to other organisms. Do you think honey has some of these very same services for, for other things that we could feed to that now get a sugar solution, for example? That is a really interesting question. I don't know that I can get a grant to study the effect of honey <laughs> on honey badgers, nor would I want to work with them. Um, but uh, that's, everyone loves honey. I mean, bears, you know, sort of classically love honey. Um, again, I'm not sure I want to work with bears, but I don't know anyone who's asked that question. And it's really interesting because again, the assumption is they're just after the sugar. I don't know, because um, bees are clearly looking for more than sugar. I mean, they will eat anything with sugar, almost anything if there's enough sugar, but otherwise they're, they are very discriminating in what they eat, um, and, or at least what they process uh, um, in, into honey. So that's just a, an excellent question. And it took, what, 20 years to convince people that honey is good for them. It may take way longer to convince people that it's good for grizzly bears. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think anyone will want to repeat that study either. You'd have to come out west where we've got a few more. Definitely. Than yeah, well, I, I'm not in a hurry to do that work. So, uh, so there's, um, should I go to the, the, it looks like there's some questions in the. In the chat. Yeah. Lisa, did you want to ask your question? Do I want to articulate it or do I want to have it read? <laughs> or articulate it. Oh, okay. Maybe that's quicker. So yeah. I. Go. Go ahead. And. Um, thank you for, for speaking, by the way. It's fascinating. Um, I'm in Alaska, and our winters are very harsh and very long. And when we are overwintering our bees, one of the ways we prepare them for that is um, <clears throat> after we harvest the honey, we start feeding them a sugar syrup, 
uh, granulated sugar uh, two to one. And many of us add some things like spearmint oil and such to increase, to give it some nutrient value. But the bees make stores out of that. So, mm -hmm. and that's what they use to sustain them through the winter. And the, the reason why we do that is because the two to one sugar um, mixture has less moisture content. So the bees have less of a need to defecate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're gonna be hived up for six months, maybe more. So many lower 48 people say, you know, always leave honey in the hive. I get that, but it's different up here. But what I'm hearing is that by doing that, we may be really leaving many of our bees vulnerable to uh, disease, virus, mites, etc. And is that accurate? And I'm also wondering, maybe that might be part of the reason overwintering up here is so difficult. It might be one of the things that contributes to our hive losses up here in the far north. Well, all I can say, this is where the, you know, um, the, what, the rubber hits the road, the, the, the laboratory hits the, you know, the real world. Um, I, it's called trans, translational, you know, the, uh, you know, the, just like in medicine for humans, you know, it's, you know, there's a proof of concept in the laboratory, then there are, um, there are clinical trials and only then is it released for, you know, use as a drug. No one, for the most part, does the translational work that takes the kind of um, studies like I've just talked about uh, to see if in fact they would do exactly what you are suggesting they might do is prolong the longevity. People don't, I mean, bees are, are really unusual in that you have workers that live, you know, four weeks in, in the summer and four months in the winter. I mean, it, it's unusual for the same life stage to have different, you know, different longevity sort of by nature. And there's a lot of interest in what controls longevity uh, in, in, in different castes. And, you know, look at the queen. She lives three to seven years. She doesn't even touch honey for the most part. She eats just royal jelly, which is a whole different seminar. Um, so in theory, uh, based on the laboratory work, it's likely that uh, some of these phytochemicals are, or honey, trouble with honey is you don't know what's in there uh, without doing the expensive chemistry um, uh, analysis, but at least p-cumeric acid and quercetin may have a longevity enhancing effect. But I, I, I can't, I would be, uh, what's the word, snake oil salesman. I couldn't say that. I can't, don't, don't pour picomeric acid into your sugar mixture because that's not been tested. It's, I don't know if it's safe. There are uh, undoubtedly unintended consequences. Um, I, I've often been told by beekeepers, um, honey isn't good for overwintering bees but I don't have enough practical experience to know whether all honeys are bad for bees or whether only certain circumstances. And I appreciate knowing if uh, people have made that observation. There are some compounds that bees need to detoxify in honey. Quercetin is one of them. If you block the enzymes that break down quercetin, bees run out of energy because, uh, well, myclobutanil is a fungicide. That's how it works. It inhibits the detoxification enzymes. So bees can't even eat their own food because uh, they're, they, they're, you know, they have, what, how many millions of years to develop a detoxification system that is exquisitely tailored to the type of food they eat. All they eat is nectar and it's, you know, and honey and pollen and bee bread. So they don't need a lot of P450s for metabolizing what a corn earworm would, might, might eat because corn earworm eats about, you know, a hundred different species of plants. So, uh, it's hard to predict, you know, it's like we, if we didn't have P450s, if we didn't have these enzymes, if something, oh, for example, if you take grapefruit with a lot of drugs like the statins, then the drug um, doesn't work the way it's supposed to because the um, grapefruit juice has a phytochemical in it that blocks our P450, the one that breaks down caffeine. So instead of enough caffeine, um, basically to, um, you know, keep you awake through a lecture if you give, um, if, if you are taking grapefruit juice with that, um, that your body can't process it and you'll stay awake all through the day. So, um, so we have the same, uh, they're called, you know, drug food interactions. 
bees have them too. I don't know if that was a long and complicated and uncomfortable answer, but. It was wonderful, no, it was, thank you. It gave me a whole bunch of more questions for you, but I'll like, <laughs> thank you. So we've got a question from Christina in the Q&A. So it says, how does, uh, how does long-term storage affect the phytochemicals content of honey? That's a Any very good question. Um, we only tested it after a year. Um, and the initial study we did with the monofluorals, it has, after a year, it has, uh, doesn't affect the antioxidant content. After 10 years, uh, you know, color changes. Uh, it can change. It doesn't in some, but honeys, but it does in others. So if the, the colors are changing, that's a good index uh, indication that the phytochemistry is changing as well. Um, but it's going to change differently for different honeys. It, it, honey is amazing stuff. I mean, it kept me busy for 20 years now. <laughs> so um, nice. anyway, uh, and, and again, this is not at the forefront of attention for most bee researchers who are really justifiably interested, more interested in the bees themselves and in more practical studies that will um, sort of apply directly to, to beekeepers, can be interpreted and applied by beekeepers directly without that, that uh, translational step. Good. A couple more questions. Uh, Melanie, did you want to ask yours? Um, Sure. Um, hi, May. I, so my question was about um, invasive plants, actually, because I, I, I find just personally that I'm on the fence a lot of times, especially with a lot of invasive removals. They don't really have necessarily something else ready to, to replace it with right away. Um, and a lot of those invasives are, or weeds, are also pretty good pollen um, uh, pollinator plants. And so there was some, uh -huh. sorry, there was some research done a um, number of years ago. It might've been 2015 or so, um, maybe even before then, actually. My, my, it's probably much, a little bit older. Um, there was a, a beekeeper actually, who's also a pediatrician and he's near Farmington, New Mexico, so near Four Corners area. And he decided to do a, a project looking at um, uh, antibiotic resistant staph infection, MRSA basically, um, and tried different honeys um, in Petri dishes. And he found that the, the honey that from his area was three times as effective as Manuka. And of course, who knows if that was pure Manuka or diluted Manuka. Um, but it, it, at any rate, he used that to then get a grant through um, UNM Pediatrics and they did some trials. And then he went further to, to work with a chemist um, from San Juan College, which is actually a community college, but they, um, did a pretty good job at analyzing the honey and also collecting some pollens to see what might be, you know, in these, in this um, elixir of sorts. And so what they found was the predominant nectar was Russian knapweed, which is a known invasive in a lot of places. Um, and so I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know this is a broad spectrum question because every place is different, but if we're learning more about what some of these plants can really offer, um, do you think there's potential for folks to re sort of re reinvestigate or at least re redefine what they consider to be invasive if it does happen to be medicinal? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I one, of, one thing I, I keep, I have to keep bringing up when there are these discussions, uh, they get very heated sometimes about, um, you know, um, well, first of all, uh, maintaining native, uh, all in favor of native plant communities. Um, there are a lot of people who are uh, hostile toward beekeeping and honeybees because they're not native. And I feel compelled to point out, we don't belong here either, at least as a, as a white person of European descent. I don't belong in North America. That's not where um, my people came from. Uh, and our landscape is so profoundly altered for human use in a way it's, uh, uh, we're never, never going to get back to um, an entirely native uh, landscape. Uh, and there's, there are places where it's important for uh, invasives to be um, controlled and kept out. I mean, I have that, that prairie savanna that we have is like under constant threat from um, uh, Oh gosh, teasel, um, 
uh, Russian olive. Um, what else do we have out there? Uh, it, you know, these incredibly aggressive invasives that will d take over. Uh, it, it takes a lot of work to maintain without burning the prairie. I don't think my neighbors would like that. Um, this is a wishy-washy answer, but in fact, you have to remember that we're squeezing these native plant communities into a already profoundly altered landscape. Um, and yes, it's, you know, I'm a big fan of native bees and native bees do much better on um, native plants and they deserve a presence in North America. They belong here. But then again, um, look what else we've brought over. There's cats and dogs running amok. There are, um, you know, there's cattle, there's wild horses in the West that and none of these animals were, are native to North America. Uh, and the same the world over, where uh, particularly Europeans take their pets and hunting subjects wherever they go. I mean, rabbits in Australia and the like. And uh, it's, it's so altered in so many ways. I mean, cities don't belong here either. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm, I like your answer. I, that's what I was saying. I'm kind of on the fence myself because I feel like it depends on the situation, but you're, you're right. And I feel that, um, you know, when you look at some of these other countries too, that have, you know, their own solitary bee species, and they also have their, their endemic honeybees, they coexist. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that that could be the same here because yeah, but you do get these extremes, which can be hard to navigate. I'm all for anything that's um, medicinal and feeds my bees. So <laughs> that's that's the bottom line there for me. Thank you so much for that answer. <laughs> so my pleasure. We'll, do, we'll do two more questions and then we'll call it a night for you. So Ron, Nick Shaw has a question around uh, if you know anything about the Apis dorsata or non-Apis uh, bee honey that is really high in moisture content, so 40%. And if you know why it doesn't spoil, like if we had uh, honeybee honey at 40%, it'd be fermented. Right. Instantly. Which honey is this? Dorsada, did you say? Dorsada. I think it's Yucatan stingless bee honey. Oh, uh, okay. Those are meloponines. Um, that's uh, astonishing. Um, I And I'm not sure. It could be the phytochemistry because um, there's some pretty powerful antimicrobial phytochemicals, but I can't say definitively. Um, not a lot of studies on the, you know, phytochemical composition of meloponine honeys. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. I see the question now. Yeah. Um, cool. They are watery and uh, that's amazing. And I also just quick answer. Um, P450s don't metabolize alcohol. Um, there's a very special enzyme that uh, um, we have that bees have. Um, uh, that metabolizes uh, ethanol, uh, but it's not a P450. <clears throat> Good stuff. And uh, I guess this one's a tough one, but it'd be, it'd do later season honeys have varying properties to help the bees through winter? And I guess that would have to be studied, I'm, I'm assuming. Well, here in the US, many parts of the US, there's nothing out there of later season. That's the problem. We have these seasonal dearths. One, one reason we, we were interested in um, trying to figure out whether the, uh, a diversity of, of the flower community helps bees resist pesticides, because often um, here in the US, there's overwintering issues because nothing grows after well here in central Illinois after the soybeans are gone you know, and corn has no nectar um, so uh, I don't know that there's even enough uh, monoflorals uh, that are being produced late in the season goldenrod I guess goldenrod is probably one that, that would be interesting to look at um, good yeah. so thank you very much well, thank you and I wish I could stay and can I get a, a recording of Absolutely. What oh. I'll do is I'll send you a link uh, once I so edit much. the videos and you'll get a link to both presentations. Really appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation, everybody. And uh, stay safe. Enjoy the spring and uh, eat honey. Be healthy. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, thanks for your time. Uh, and thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Uh, so let's see. I'll, uh, I'll actually put my video on so you can, I guess it is on. Uh, so for those who may not know me, so my name is Etienne Tardif. I am now, I guess, the president of WAS, uh, 
from last December. Uh, I live up in the Yukon. Uh, I've been keeping bees in total now for about uh, 12, 13 years, about eight years up in the Yukon. Uh, and uh, I guess the reason I got interested, and I guess if you know what I do, I'm an engineer, uh, but I like taking deep dives in a lot of things. So I've done things on uh, thermal regulation of bees to understand what happens in a wintering hive. I've done deep dives on uh, Nosema and I guess now amoeba disease, uh, just trying to figure out uh, what's going on with uh, some of my colonies. And over the last year and a half, two years, I've been looking at honey in the Yukon and just trying to understand, is it different? Uh, it tastes different uh, and there's a lot of variability. So what I did is I put a small, I guess, a, a infinite sized uh, project together uh, because there's so much to learn about honey, as you know, uh, to compare honey in the Yukon with other places in Canada and a few international types of honeys. So what I did is I did, uh, I taught myself how to do pollen analysis and I used a lab down in Vancouver to do uh, NMR analysis to get sugar profiles, uh, amino acids, organic acids, some indicators, uh, so about 33 different indicators. And then what I did is I compiled all the data together and it's an ongoing project, uh, but uh, yeah, it's fun. And for me, it's about learning. So in the Yukon, we're not a big beekeeping place, but uh, uh, we do have a beekeeper successfully. We overwinter from Dawson down to Whitehorse to basically the central area of the Yukon. Uh, it's equivalent to the interior of Alaska weather-wise. We've got no coastal areas, uh, but uh, one funny thing is I'm fairly successful at overwintering, but we've got a lot of beekeepers that are struggling. And uh, part of understanding honey was to try to get, uh, to see if there's a connection to our honey and winter survival. So I'll just maximize my screen. So the journey is when I first started up here, it took me about two years to get my first honey harvest. And then, uh, then I got a wonderful crop of honey and it was dark, 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 and it was woody tasting and it was really viscous. And I'd never seen honey like that before. And it was weird. And that winter, I lost all my colonies. So it was only four, so I lost four colonies and there was dysentery, there was poop everywhere, you know, sema and all the bees. And I was like, hmm. And this is where I bought myself a microscope so I could actually auto test uh, and test my own, uh, my bees. And then I quickly discovered the feces was full of nosema, the bee guts were full of nosema. And, uh, and that was an interesting observation. And I took a lot of pictures. So now that I know what amoeba disease is, I was noticing these cysts floating around in the, in the feces. Uh, soon after, uh, there was another beekeeper when I went to Alaska who put me on to honeydew. So at that point, I sent my honey down to the lab in Vancouver and they confirmed that it was honeydew honey. And I was like, okay, cool. So then I started doing some research in what is honeydew honey and what's good and bad about it. So for, uh, for humans, it's dark, it's uh, different tasting and it's, it's, it's high in vitamins and minerals and complex sugars, but uh, it only had about probably a good, about 30% less simple sugars than the typical honey in uh, say the prairies of Canada. Okay, so that that clued me in that hmm, they need to consume 30% more to get the same energy output. So it was uh, so it creates more feces, they poop more, our long winters keeps them in the colonies and then it was just a, some, some lots of questions to ask. So then for the following five years, I was sending my honeys out to get analyzed. And then I noticed that every year my honey was different. Okay, sometimes it was dark, less dark, light, different flavors. So it was just uh, an interesting thing that I wanted to look at. I bought myself a book on pollen analysis and a little centrifuge on Amazon. And then I started looking into uh, what the pollen content was in my, uh, my honey. Uh, I do a lot of winter monitoring, 
but also I collect data. That's what I do for a living. I collect data and I coach people on how to use the data to, to do stuff. So then my pollen collection. So I was looking at the pollens coming into the colony, uh, the type of pollens, the ratios, the volumes. And then I got curious about the flowers they were coming from. And then I got to honey. I said, huh. So it's really delicious. But then I was like, okay, what are the, the nectar sources of our honeys up here? Uh, because it's really, really weird. So over here, this is a picture of, I think this is a healthy colony. I took a bee, a couple of uh, live bees uh, from a colony this winter. This was back in March. And then because I've been doing pollen analysis for a while, I can recognize some of these pollens. So you've got a Jacob's Ladder here, some fireweed. You've got some willow in the background. Uh, there's some goldenrod in there. So knowing the bloom cycles, We've got honeys in the bee guts from basically May to August. Okay, so from the different nectar flows and from the different pollen flows. I was like, oh, interesting. Uh, and as I go through the presentation, you'll, you'll see a, a few different things. So what I wanted to know is, is Yukon honey special? And like May mentioned, Dr. Berenbaum, so all honey is special, especially raw honey that hasn't been processed too much. Is Yukon honey an outlier? Is it like other Canadian honeys? Uh, are there any special properties or dist distinguishing traits? Uh, what's the impact on wintering? Excuse me. And what's the risk up here of, of adulteration uh, due to the winter feeding that we do? Like Lisa just mentioned, we start feeding our bees in August and we do feed in in uh in may usually but uh once the nectar flow goes and the pollen flow goes we don't really feed our, our our bees very much so we've pulled our supers before we feed or after we fed so there's there's very little interaction in that so this is just an example of energy output i won't bore you with all the details i'm going to skip some of these slides but this for example was one of my honeydews typically in the 50 gram to 60 gram per 100 gram of honey versus a typical i guess southern honey from my perspective is around the 70 to 75 gram and the one thing with honeydews like i said there's a lot of stuff in it and I'll show you a couple of bee guts and you'll see there's a lot of algae and crystallized sugars and, and stuff that the bees can digest. So that just adds to the, the poop factor. Uh, excuse my language. Uh, and then the sugar syrup, so just using straight sucrose, is pretty much 99% sucrose. So very little ash content. So the uh, very little impact on the, I guess, the gut from a, a, a feces perspective. So what I did was, like I said, I use NMR and I, I have trouble with big long words. So pollen analysis to, uh, to look at uh, close to 50 honeys. And I got some lab reports from other beekeepers. So I've got about 66 uh, lab reports that I compiled together just to do some comparison. So this is just an example of some of the snapshots. So you'll see there's in here, there's, uh, I think 30, 30, the honeys are from the Yukon. There's some from Northern BC. There's a couple from the prairies. So from Alberta, a few from Quebec, and there's a couple Turkish honeys. Uh, and I did buy uh, some commercial brands. So Walmart, uh, Bee Made, and St. Michael's it's called, just to put some, some some commercial honeys in there and see what they look like. And you can see how this was a beekeeper in Prince George. Uh, she sent me a bunch of her honey and the darker ones, they're pretty much pretty consistent with uh, being honeydew honeys. And the other thing with uh, one of the reasons I did this is a lot of Yukon honeys fail the NMR tests, but on different criteria. So I did run a run uh, I purposely put sucrose syrup, sugar uh, syrup in uh, some honeys, the same honey at different concentrations, just to see what it would look like. 
So this is basically my main apiary is out in the field here. And you can see it's a mixed boreal forest, uh, some open swamps and meadows. And it's, it's pretty much native uh, plants and fauna. And we've got a mix of all three, depending on locations. So I wanted to know where things are coming from. So May, Dr. Berenbaum covered a lot of this, but uh, basically honey is derived from nectar and honeydew and it contains pollen. And what I'm gonna show you is, for example, the Walmart brand is hyper processed and filtered and there's hardly any uh, pollen in there. So I'd say some of these lower non-raw honeys have very little pollen uh, and the amino acids and the acid profiles and stuff are very uh, non they're not interesting. So they're very, it, it's basically a, a sugar syrup. So, but the raw honeys, like the bee made raw was wonderful. It uh, basically, it had uh, some nice properties in it. So anyways, you got proteins and most of the proteins are usually from, uh, uh, from the pollen content. There's amino acids, there's a bunch of them. Enzymes uh, that the bees add, but also that the, say the aphids, so the sap sucking insects, the ones that produce the, uh, uh, the honeydew, uh, and they will give you different organic profiles. Uh, so you've got organic acids, for example, citric malic oxalic is a lot of times if associated with honeydew. Uh, there's shikimic acids, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that I didn't know, and I'm still learning. So you've got minerals, you can see that a blossom honey has very low uh, mineral content, but the honeydew goes up to 1% sometimes. Uh, vitamins, so it's good for humans, it's good for consumption, but it might not be the West uh, wintering honey because it might be hard to digest. Uh, there's lipids, uh, the phenolic compounds, and this, if I had to add a future project, is would be to look at the phenolic compound of uh, Yukon honeys, just to, and that's what I would need to do. There's something called HMF, and it's, it's really a degradation indicator, especially for North American, Northern honeys, uh, where it's not tropical. Uh, it's, they're typically zero, but if you heat the honey, if it's stored too long, it starts changing colors and there's uh, HMF produced, then basically it's not a good thing to have in your honey. And most of the commercial brands had higher HMF. Uh, Be Made had zero, which is good. Uh, but it, it just shows that when you do go to the grocery store, if you pick the cheapest honey on the shelf, uh, being a beekeeper, I never do that, but it's, it's, it's actually probably not the best honey to have. Uh, so I've taken lots of my cross QP pictures, uh, but I'll, I'll cover sugars mostly in this talk. And really there's an infinite number of complex combination of sugars and honey. Because you'll notice that there's so many different pollens and fungal spores, so which indicate uh, this is a honeydew honey with uh, this is from BC, uh, from the Buckley area, and there's common these fungal spores are associated with the leafy plants. Uh, there's some rubus, so probably some rose and different things. There's some algae in the background here. So it's just interesting when I started looking at it to see that, oh, wow, it's having one type of honey. Uh, once you start looking at it, it, you just see the complexity of what's possible. And it's basically, it's nectar, it's the sort of blossoms, the honeydew, soil type, altitude, the weather. So for example, raffinose is a, it's a complex sugar, uh, a triple bond, I think it is. And it is also associated to honeydew, but also when plants are in stress, they'll produce uh, raffinose. Uh, again, aphids, different type of aphids have different enzymes. So they'll produce and break down the sugars differently. In the Yukon, we have about 50 types of uh, aphids. So it just adds, and they're associated with specific host plants. So on the pollen analysis, uh, so basically I read a book uh, I read a bunch of papers, I watched some videos, 
and I just started doing it. Uh, so first off is I collected about 90, 90 different flowers. Okay. So I would take the flowers, I put them in a Ziploc and I froze them. And then the next winter, what I did is I pulled the pollen, put slides and I created myself a nice uh, reference. So once I knew what a, say a dandelion pollen looked like. So once I look at slides, I can actually see, okay, this is, this is, uh, uh, sorry, this is dandelion pollen. This is willow pollen. This is crocus. This is so berry. So, so I just mapped out uh, the time and the type of, uh, of pollen. Uh, so this is my bloom calendar that I built a while back. Uh, this is just an example of uh, microscopic uh, pollen grains. So this is the pea family. And you can see there's resemblance. And sometimes I don't know what it is, but I know what family it's from. So I'll just indicate the family. Uh, aphids. Uh, so you can take pictures, you go out in the field, you see all these aphids. And I'm like, huh, because I'm trying to understand what triggers a honeydew flow in the north. And you can see these numbers represent different uh, aphid species and how they're associated to different uh, plant families. Uh, once you start looking at stuff in the microscope, there's a lot of, the, I'm not a microbiologist. I, I, the only microscope I used really in university was to look at steel and uh, inclusions and dendrites and stuff like that. So it had nothing to do with uh, biology. So I, I've had to learn, read papers and ask questions. So over here, for example, this is algae. Uh, and then uh, what I'm doing now, and I'm slowly building a reference to what the associated plants are. So for example, this uh, cattail looking thing is associated to the rose family. Okay. Uh, and it's just, it's tedious, but basically I could do other things, but uh, for me, this is a hobby and learning is what I like doing. So sample prep, fairly easy. I take 10 grams of honey. I dissolve it in about uh, 70 mils of uh, distilled warm water. I add some isopropyl alcohol after it's all distilled or uh, uh, dissolved. And this is to lower the specific gravity. Uh, so that I get better separation. Okay, and I stick it in here and I spin it, I guess I could do it at a lower RPM, but I spin it twice. Uh, and then I get this material in the bottom here. Okay, so what this does is then I put this on a slide and I mount it in a jelly that I, I can use. I have a box now with like close to 100 slides of different honeys. And then I can use it to count pollens, get ratios and all that dumb stuff. Uh, and this is an example of a fireweed honey. And you can see what I do is I count the different pollen greens in these different boxes at a lower magnification. And you can see you've got some lingonberries, you've got some fireweed. And depending on the different grains, you might, some grains are, uh, it's called uh, overrepresented or underrepresented or just even. So, for example, fireweed is a really big pollen. And it actually gets filtered by the, the crop of the, the honeybee. So a lot of it actually never makes it to the honey. So if you see this, it's actually equivalent to say 100 grains of willow, which is the background here. Okay, so in that book that I bought, it had all these different uh, explanations. And then I just built some tools that do it. Uh, so in the background, there's some sweet clovers, some prickly rose, and then a few lingon berries. And this was just one of my counting sheets. And technically I've got about 20 done now, but I probably have another 20 to do. So I just do it in my free time. So I get to it when I get to it. Uh, and basically using different things, it, it's sort of helping me understand what the honeys are. And the reason pollen analysis is, is good is I can look at the chemical profile in the uh, the NMR test and start seeing some relationships. So one thing is, like I said, a lot of Yukon honeys are flagged as adulterated. And also a lot of fireweed honeys are flagged as adulterated. Okay, understanding the beekeeping and knowing that 
uh, the last feeding was probably three months before this honey is produced or two months before it, it doesn't make sense. So what I'll do is I'll show you how I I've determined that uh, it's just because we're not in the databases of the typical honey and that's why it's failing and it's failing on different criteria that uh, a typical adulterated honey is. So this is just a typical uh, Yukon multifloral honey, it's a lot of willow. Uh, there's a few non-invasives, but uh, basically bare root. Jacob's ladder is a big one here. So, uh, and then lingonberry. Again, lingonberry is here. So fireweed is very underrepresented, and lingonberry, so low bush cranberry, is another underrepresented uh, honey or sorry pollen. So, and I've looked at this one chemically, and it helps me understand. Uh, Basically now I can smell honey, I can taste honey, and I can actually tell you what it is. Because uh, I've noticed people label honey, and then when I ran, say, a blueberry honey from uh, northern Quebec, I looked at it and there was no blueberry grains, very few. So they probably had the colony on that field, and this was a commercial brand, but when I looked at the pollen profile, there was probably less than 1% of blueberry pollen. So that it tells me that folks aren't really testing their honeys and they're mislabeling their, their honeys. And one neat thing is once you get, and the reason I'm doing this is again, if you smell the forest where your flowers are and then you open up the hive and it smells exactly the same way, it's a pretty good indicator that there's a connection there. So for example, the forest here is just covered with uh, low bush cranberries everywhere. So when it's in bloom, you smell the forest and it smells really sweet and blossoming. And when you smell the colonies, it smells exactly the same way. And this is just a confirmation of that. So honeydew honey, this was a, a true outlier. So this gray mass in the background, these are algaes, uh, these cat-like things. So the source here is probably, uh, there's probably willow willow honeydew there's rose honeydew uh, because of the association with these spores and uh, this is that 50 gram per 100 gram of honey uh, honeydew so really low sugar content so good for humans it's basically the glycemic index is wonderful for diabetics uh, but uh, it's not good for the bees uh, so this is one of my honeys that i did a, a crush and strain when i first started and you can see there's so many pollens. Okay, you can't really use this to do pollen analysis because it's it's contaminated. But it still gives you an idea. These big ones here, these are fireweed. The bottom matrix is uh, willow. There's some uh, lingonberry in there, Jacob's ladder. So you can still get an idea of what's in there. Bee guts. Uh, so this is this past winter. Uh, so basically, again, you see a mix. I see willow and then fireweed. There's two months between the bloom dates here. Okay, so it tells me that the bees are getting nutrition and they're storing more pollen, either in the honey or inside the, that box than I thought they did. Okay, which is good. Over here, this is another bee gut. And it actually looks like honeydew. Okay, because it has algae. And then it's got some of these, uh, I think it's a poplar, a poplar rust spore. And these dark masses, these are all winter fungal spores. So this bee was a dead bee. Uh, and I analyzed my dead bees and I could see a bunch of rust spores and fungal spores. And basically it, it, all this stuff can be digested by the bees. So it just gives me more questions. But it also, I can look at the bee guts now and see, are they eating honeydew honey? Okay, because I know what the honeydew honey looks like and it, it helps me better understand what's going on. So on the nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, so you get these reports. And a lot of the time, the lab doesn't really explain it, and you don't really understand what's going on. So uh, one, th one purpose here is to, to, I'll probably write a guide, a practical guide to reading these reports for a beekeeper, because they'll just say pass fail, and they won't tell you much other than that. But uh, so for example, this is a Yukon honey, 
uh, it's low in glucose, which is typical uh, because there's higher content. So for example, a typical Canadian honey would be pretty much in the middle here, but the Yukon honeys are on the outer edge. And these, this thing here is basically a multivariate analysis. Basically it's where they plot uh, like items. This here is, it's just to test this why I did Turkish honeys. It's to see if it could differentiate between a Canadian honey and a Turkish honey, and they can, because it's in a other category. And when you do it, it tells you all these different things, peaks that are, are non-variant. So there's a lot of info. And one of the things that I had to learn was where do the different uh, sugars come from? And I found this paper and it explained in decent detail about uh, some of the different uh, sh sugar sources uh, from the nectars or the honeydew. And then it helps me further on. Uh, so up here is, I've never really had this, but this was one of my colonies where the sugar syrup honey actually crystallized. And I had all these crystal things and you can see different sizes down here. This is I think from New Zealand or actually from Germany. And this is an example of what gummed up Melizito's uh, honey looks like. And this is a really bad honey. So it's associated to uh, primarily honeydew and it's really hard for the bees to digest because I was trying to figure out do I have this in my colonies and I don't seem to I guess the plants up here the honeydew doesn't seem to produce much uh, melanzitose so on the processing uh, so most of the non-commercial brands or the like raw honeys had very low HMF, which is good. HMF is not good for the bees. Uh, it's actually not good for humans if it's in too high of concentration. It's also an indicator of, of processing. So typically sometimes you'll get darker honeys. Uh, so like that blueberry honey and some of the, like the Walmart wasn't too bad, it was mid-level. Uh, but uh, actually the blueberry one was at the, I have it down here, it was at the upper limit of what the recommended level was. Okay, so Bee Made had zero HMF, which tells me it's a true raw honey. Uh, the one thing, it was very low in proline, a, an amino acid that's usually associated with uh, bee enzymes and sometimes pollens. The Turkish uh, honey, so there was a blossom in pine honey, because I get spruce, I get uh, fir tree, honeydew honey here, so I wanted something to compare it to. Uh, it was completely different. They both failed the test. I'm not sure if it's because it's actually adultered or it's just not in the database, but uh, there's a good chance that it is adultered to a certain extent uh, because a lot of the typical fail criteria were, were marked red. Uh, the Walmart brand, like I said, really high in sugar, moderate HMF, and there was nothing in it. Very, like in a slide, there was less than 100 grains of pollen per 100 gram of honey, which is pretty much nothing. So for me, I, I'll, I'll be a key beekeeper, I'll never buy anything that's over-processed, and I'll look for local brands uh, or farmers markets and stuff like that. It just reaffirms why we love our honey more than what we buy in the store. Seems complicated. Uh, so basically, this is in case any of you ever do a similar project. So basically, these are all the different honeys in their locations. Uh, and what I did was just a similarity, a correlation matrix. Okay. And it's, it's to help me understand what honeys are similar and which ones are different. So for example, this honey here at the end, the red box, that's my honeydew honey, the extreme version, okay? And you can see it's an outlier. It's nowhere close than any other honey in my, uh, in, my, in, in my collection. Then the next one here was a spruce honeydew from the following year. And then another one here, and you can see how basically the yellows if you just follow them, it shows there's a relationship there. There's, there's a connection. So what I did, it's comparing 20, 
30 variables for 66 honey. And it's just a quick way. This is just standard Excel. And I was just trying to see what relationship can I find? Okay, and similarities. And this is to help me understand geographical uh, similarities, because then some of these honeys are in specific areas. Ah, they're connected. The other ones, oh, there's, that was a honeydew year because there's different years. Other ones is it's a different region. So it's in BC. So BC honeys are different. Oh, these ones are, I've got 12 fireweed honeys. And I'd say the majority are similar, but then there's some differences. And it looks like it's secondary nectar sources are making those differences. This was all those chemical compounds and looking at relationship in those. So for example, a big one for me is, and you've gone, why are honeys failing these tests? It's, it's because of, of uh, the honeydew content. We have a lot of combo honeys that mix of blossom and honeydew. And one of the indicators is raffinose. And raffinose is positively correlated to these uh, acids and negatively correlated to these sugars. So hence low sugars. And it's a way for when I look at these reports now, I can say, oh yeah, this is a very strong honeydew or a partial, and it just, it gave me some information. So I plotted all the 66 honeys on these charts and it just gave me an idea of what the differences are between adultered blossom, combo blossom honeydew, honeydew, and then the Turkish honeys, just to see how different stuff is, okay? And it's clear the MNR uh, test, it does tell me a lot about uh, the honeydew. And it may be one of the reasons why beekeepers up here who overwinter with minimal feeding struggle is, and then have dysentery and different types of issues is because the honey uh, is just, it's honeydew. So it's harder to digest, more pooping. Uh, they need more to produce the same amount of energy. And in general, Yukon or boreal forest honey has a lower sugar content than a typical prairie uh, or urban or agricultural type honey. Okay, and you can see that because these are the energy honeys or sugars. Okay, glucose and fructose is it's what the bees consume or convert into uh, into energy. Uh, they do convert the other ones, but it requires more effort because the sugar is more complex. Uh, and you can see there's so many different analyses you can do, uh, but you can see how these ratios of fructose glucose is a pretty good indicator of adultered uh, honeys. And as you go up, uh, the, the differences. So a lot of, again, the, the northern honeys, the boreal forest honeys have a higher ratio, which is typical with uh, uh, certain nectar sources, but also honeydew. Again, raffinose uh, and a few different ones. Uh, the one reason fireweed honey fails a lot is there's a big chunk, I'd say about half of the fireweed honey, so about six of them, had very, very low proline. Okay, so if you understand, most of our, our fireweed honey up here is from old forest fire burns. So, and the fireweed is the first plant to go up. Okay, there might be a, some earlier plants, but during the main nectar flow, there's only fireweed and very few other things. So basically, the honey doesn't have much pollen. And I'm assuming that the, I guess the proline content is low because of something in the honey. And it's also low in sugar. So it's a good indicator of that. And, but it's failing the test, uh, the NMR test. So it's being flagged as uh, adulterated, but if you look at it, it, it's not. And over here, for example, it's malic acid is associated with willow. Uh, willow type honeydew and it, it just tells me things and then over here some of the bc fireweeds i think there were seven of them uh, are associated with uh, leucine and, and there's uh, there's different things a lot of info so again it, if you want this i can give you this presentation but what it will do is if you do get your honey tested it'll give you an idea of how to read the report 
So honeydew indicators, again, high malic acid, raffinose, all these types of things. If you do, uh, if you want to learn pollen analysis, it's actually not that hard. It just takes time to, to learn the pollen grains. And if you know this stuff, then you start learning the smells and the flavors of the different honeys, and then it helps uh, you better understand stuff. And some of these different fungal spores, again, you, you can figure out what uh, plants are associated to, but uh, you can see how when I did this, uh, uh, this bite plot, I've never done one of these before this project. So I got myself some statistical software. I had to learn how to do it. I got it up to about 80% of the variance explained. Uh, but this one here basically grouped the honeys pretty good uh, between honeydews from different regions. You've got a couple Quebec honeydews. You've got uh, BC honeydew. You've got my outlier honeydew. You've got my spruce. So basically knowing enough info and knowing where some of these fungal spores come from, help me understand, is it from fir trees? So uh, versus deciduous origins. And then this leucine is opposite to proline. I didn't put it on there, but you can see as these ones here have different indicators and you can actually see how the adultered honey is actually inside these groupings. Okay, so it might be one of the reasons why some of the fireweed honeys get uh, confused with uh, fake honey. Uh, so boral versus ag. Again, the it's just the sugar content, and there's a lot more uh, honeydew and HDEs, so honeydew elements, and those are possible reasons why it's it's harder for the bees to to last six months up here in the winter to to overdo the winter. Darker honeys, there's good and bad. So in a honeydew, it's high in that phenylic content, so the, the, the good phytochemicals and all that, uh, which is good, but it's negated, I believe. So again, I'd, we'd have to test this, but with all the stuff in it that the bees can't digest. But what I've noticed is the dark honey, so that blueberry honey, the walnut honey, and some of these other darker honeys, had much higher HMF and it's associated with processing and heating. And on the adultered uh, things, there are uh, the, the honeys that I put sugar syrup in. Uh, this is sad. Okay. So the one in 5% were just flagged as curious. They weren't, they didn't fail. Okay. So don't get any ideas. But this was not a good thing because sugar syrup is much cheaper than honey. So when I noticed that a 5% uh, sugar syrup honey didn't actually fail, it actually made me sad. Uh, and only the 10 and 25%, uh, basically the 25% failed, but this 10%, it just flagged the sucrose saying, hmm, it needs special interpretation. So for an average person, they wouldn't know that basically that honey is adulterated. Uh, so because I was working with the lab, the lab gave me all these uh, spectra of the different honeys uh, and the spectra here. So this is how they measure how much of the different chemicals is in the honey. And there's some interesting papers out of Finland on uh, different types of honeys. And this is where I started making connections between uh, this is a lingonberry honey. This is a sugar profile of the lingonberry uh, honey. When I did the bonnell analysis, I can see there's lots of it, lots of lingonberry in there with some willow and some honeydew, hence some of the different peaks are different. But uh, it's it's where I started connecting the dots, and this was like two days ago I connected this dot. So most of the Yukon honey, you can see Canadian honeys are in the middle. Yukon honeys are on the outer edge, which says that they're very different. Uh, so that was one of the my hypothesis to say a Yukon honey is different. Uh, and one reason I did this project is we don't have agriculture up here and our honey is actually, it's, there's no pesticides, there's no, there's no nothing. It's just natural, it's born of forest, it's beautiful honey. Uh, it tastes great because uh, I've got like 70, I collect honey, so I eat honeys from everywhere. So it's, it's my favorite honey, it's spicy. So it's really, really good. So one add-on to my project that I did, I did get funding from uh, 
an agricultural program in Canada. Uh, so they gave me some money to help me pay for these uh, lab tests and it helped uh, pay for my lab supplies, my slides and some of the chemicals. Uh, but uh, again, a lot of the boreal forest honeys fail, uh, about 10 of them. Many are flagged as not Canadian, actually 27 out of the 28 uh, Yukon honeys tested as not Canadian. Okay, it tells me, so we're not in the database. Uh, again, Yukon honeys tend to be higher in complex sugars. Uh, and basically what I did is I added 30%. Uh, so basically two to one uh, sugar syrup in my honey by weight. And I sent it to the lab uh, and I didn't tell them what I did. And I said, just test this. And I labeled things and then I got the results back. Uh, and I guess the results on here was the one in five, it was flagged, but it passed 10% passed, but it was just saying sucrose looks funny. And then the only one that actually failed was a 25%, which uh, made me sad because most of the, like I said, 10 Yukon honeys fail. And I, I put that much sugar in it and it didn't fail. It was like, hmm, this is weird. And this is just an example of what it looks like when you get your uh, your results back. And again, so this is Yukon honey, and this was a beautiful late season honey, late August. Uh, and I hadn't fed that year, so there was no way that colony had sugar zero in it. Complicated, but these are, this is an example of some of these spectra. They get these lines above these typical peaks. The red is the average level. And anything above that is off the chart. So this was just an example of rice syrup, but you can see how the adultered stuff, these yellow boxes with red text, this is where it failed on the 25%. And my Yukon honey here, you can see how it failed on a completely different indicator, which just, I scratch my head. So what I need to do is get my samples put in as Yukon honey and, and, and make it regional. And then over here too, there was, uh, I think was yeah, Mount Lorne and another Tikini honey. It failed by like one or 2%. So it's just, uh, it doesn't make sense. Lots of numbers. And that's the challenge when you get this thing is you try to understand what it means. But once you can see, for example, if you have melizitos, you know, oh, it's a honeydew. If it's raffinose, then it's typically a honeydew. If it's low sugar, then it's something else. It, it, it tells you a story. And uh, I'll skip that. And then basically I looked at studies from different regions. So in Europe, they've done a lot of studies on honeydews and different results. And this is how I make my assumptions and I, I do some comparatives and, and it gives me things to compare to. Okay. And then over here, once you in Europe again, they, they've done a lot of honey testing and it, it just helps me understand stuff. So hopefully it wasn't too long, too technical, but uh, I guess the main purpose of me doing this study was one to understand my regional honey, where the nectar sources are, where the marketing opportunities are. So if I get a, a honeydew honey or a, a lingonberry honey, there's an opportunity to market that because it's, it's, it's unique to North America, really. And the other one is, are we doing something to our honey uh, with the sugar syrup we feed? Uh, what's the good stuff in there? So there's some interesting acids, like shikimic acid is related to, for example, this honeydew honey, and there's medicinal property. So there's all these trigger projects now that if I want to dig deeper, I can basically uh, find a lab that does... Uh, phytochemical testing and, and look into that. But uh, hopefully it was informative. Uh, and uh, if you've got any questions, please uh, ask away. Hey Dan, this is Dewey again. Sure. Um, I'm, uh, the the uh, centrifuging down the pollen grains so you, you picked out a couple of instances, Walmart and uh, the blueberry, but it, can't there be an instance where the bees are actually going there and collecting nectar 
but there's um, relatively little chance that the pollen will get in. And I'm thinking blueberry where bumblebees have to buzz the flower to release the uh, pollen itself. So honeybees can't do that. So maybe they're going there and getting nectar. So it might be valid blueberry honey, but we couldn't use pollen analysis to try to demonstrate that it is at that validity. Exactly. And that's that whole under and over represented and blueberry is an underrepresented honey. So it's one of those observations. And uh, I, we, I, I do have the chemical profile for it and I do have a chemical profile for uh, a blueberry honey. So I'll be comparing that further. Uh, but there should have been because it's similar to lingonberry and my lingonberry flowers and the fire and the uh, blueberry flowers are pretty identical. So they, it should be fairly close. And, uh, and a tip uh, I've seen sampling of other blueberry honey. So uh, where there was a significant amount of, uh, of uh, blueberry uh, pollen. So I, I agree with what you said there. So I need to dig in a bit more. Uh, but looking at it, there was like raspberry was a dominant and these are re really good nectar producing plants. So a lot of the pollens like dandelion, raspberry, all the stuff in there was really good nectar producing plants. Interesting. Thank you. Good, 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 good talk. Lots of information. Always. It's my flaw. Julia? I was just saying how interesting that was. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so I'm wondering, um, in the city, you get this dark, dark honey, like downtown Vancouver, very caramely uh, looking and tasting. And I always thought, I wonder if that's honeydew down there because of so many trees. And then, so that's kind of my question. Have you had any wonderings about urban honey? Um, and then the other question is, I guess, is it round the world? Blueberry honey would show the same or these honeys, you know, if you catch them in each different country, it also give you the same result. Is that even a question? Sorry. It, it'll be close. No, it, it makes complete sense. And what I need to do is ask Dr. Aram for the profile for a blueberry honey. And just ask him the question, say, hey, here's a blueberry honey. Is this blueberry honey? Because uh, from a pollen perspective, I agree with Dewey. Uh, for plants that are underrepresented, it, it's really hard to say yay or nay. It's just an indicator. It's not a, an absolute answer. So, And on the, the honeydew, I, I guess uh, if you'd send me a sample, I'll, uh, I'll check it out. It's actually you know fairly, it's, it's easier to do with microscopy. Uh, it takes me 15 minutes to prep a sample and put it on a slide. And, and okay. then basically I look at it and I could see the algae and the fungal spores and get a quick bird's eye view of what it is. But uh, Awesome. Okay, uh, Tim, because I just yep. found a jar from years ago and it's the downtown east side honey. But yeah, because I always hear people talking around the world, you know, oh, this urban honey, caramel, dark. That's why. Okay, thanks, Etienne. I'll do that. And I guess my comment to beekeepers out there is uh, this could be, so if you do have access to some funding or some grant money, uh, it, it might be a regional or bee club type uh, uh, project. I'd say for bee clubs, buy yourself a microscope. It's because uh, I'm sure that in every bee club, there's at least one bee geek. And once you start looking at stuff, it's like, oh, what's this? What's that? And it's, it's a really interesting journey. And I guess what I'll do is I'll share the, the book uh, reference to go. I bought it on Northern Bee Books and uh, it's a damn good book. It's got about 400 different. Uh, Etienne, you have a question from the Q and A. Um, do most of the beekeepers in your area of the world use insulated hives? In the winter, yes. Uh, no. So basically in the winter, we all have to basically insulate our colonies. Uh, but in the, in the summer, it's a mix. So in my location, 
I don't think I'd get much honey if my hives were not insulated because of the cold mornings. Most of the bees, I think, would uh, consume the extra honey just staying warm if they were in a wooden colony uh, because our typical morning temperatures anywhere from Celsius, sometimes 10 if we're lucky. Uh, so, but then it'll go up to 20, 25 during the day Celsius. So, uh, and the plants are, are hardy up here, so they'll, they'll, they'll keep going, but uh, I'd say uh, insulation is a must for my area in the summer, but in other areas, uh, they get away with just wood colonies. And uh, when I went to Apimondia a couple of years ago, one thing on uh, honeydew, so if you were in an area that produces a lot of honeydew, the, uh, <clears throat> the Polish beekeepers and the Slo Slovaks, uh, they're looking for honeydew because it's really big in Europe. So if you are a commercial beekeeper and you do have access to a lot of honeydew, there is a market internationally for honeydew honey, especially if you know what it is. Uh, and then the outlier, the 2017 honey, they had no idea what it was. They'd never tasted honey like that before. So what we'll do, uh, if that's it for questions, you can always email me if you have questions. I don't mind sharing how I did my samples and all my procedures. So, but uh, yeah, it was a fun project. And basically now I know how to do it. And when I squish my bee guts or dissect the bee guts, I also know now what they're eating, which I didn't know before. It was just a mass. So it gives you a different uh, perspective to look at bees from. That was a great talk, Ntn. Good. Thanks, Etienne. Thanks no worries. Thanks for the feedback. And uh, I guess next week, or not next week, on June 14th, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Walsh. Uh, she's doing some work up at uh, Beaver Lodge. So she'll be talking about, I believe it's chalk root, and the research and the studies they're doing up at uh, Beaver Lodge on that. That'll be our first speaker. And our second speaker will be Dr. Marley Iredale from uh, University of Florida. Uh, she's the one I've been working on with uh, on the amoeba disease, but she's going to be doing a talk on uh, pathogens and viruses and bees. Uh, she's a pathologist, so she'll be doing a talk on that. And I'll be bees and the talk descriptions in the next uh, week or so.